This week, I would like to tell you a few odds and ends about Paul Cezanne. It is said of Cezanne that he worked so slowly that he placed one piece of paint, let us say, every four hours. It said so. I can hardly believe that. Apparently, it's quite true. He spent literally days and weeks in, in making the composition. He would place a, a coin under something to raise it a bit and so on. Everything was placed very carefully. I've actually chucked this down in this sense and just uh, made a quick composition. Paul Cézanne was born in Aix-en-Provence in France in 1839 of uh, uh, quite a wealthy family. His, they knew very rich. His father bought a banking firm. He used to be in the tailoring, hattering business and so on. Um, and became very rich because of this. And he made Paul an allowance which enabled him to study art locally. We endeavoured to get into the Echo de Beaux-Arts in Paris, but failed, as indeed one could virtually say he was a failure throughout the most of his life, despite his connections, because he knew Bernard and Gauguin and Van Gogh and Camille Pissarro, who taught him early on in the 70s the art of Impressionism. And of course, Impressionism, the technique of Impressionism, is a delightful method of painting, but of course it has its limitations because it's relatively easy to do. I say that with all respect, uh, but it's not enough for uh, the intellectual mind of a uh, man like Cezanne, who want, demanded more of it. And I suppose because of his lack of fame and success early on, drove him relentlessly to um, express himself in a more abstracted form of painting. Now, if you paint the shape itself in what is known as the local colour, that is the colour of the object, local colour, it creates the shape for you in flat pattern. There's a little chap behind here hiding. I'll paint that in. And this gives an idea generally over the whole painting of each of the component flat shapes. Cezanne was into, he would draw through the glass, just like painting naked flesh under a costume life, through the glass. We paint the lemon, very sh shapey lemon, in the pure colour. And Cezanne was at great pains to emphasize not only the flat shape, but a spatial relationship. We now come into the aesthetics of painting, very complicated. It's very difficult to teach his type of painting because unlike the academic painters like Turner, Kunstler, and so forth, he was at pains to create a new form of looking, a new form of seeing. Therefore, he used a technique of painting the whole thing right through, which of course takes weeks, but at the end of it, there's a little peach here. Now I'll give it a peach flat shape colour. But it's adjacent friends here. There's the three balls of Lombardy, the pawnbrokers, he, which reminds me that Cezanne didn't need pawnbrokers. He was very, very wealthy all his life. And so, for the whole of his life, he could indulge himself in what it is, playing about with painting, in order to create a new form of art. He didn't have to go to living at it. Of course, in the drawing of the peach, for example, he would stop and draw the cloth around it very carefully. This gives you an extra chance to redraw. Now, I'm an old house painter, 
And of course, when young, we were trained to what we called cut in. And so, obviously, I am trained enough to be able to cut round things. But it's not a good thing, thing to do in ordinary <coughs> art, in the sense of uh, academic painting. It's a very bad thing to cut in because there are no lines as such in nature. And indeed, it's a good thing to make ragged edges where you can and areas of color where there should be white. You, you create the shadows in a brilliant series of adjacent tones. We start off with a blue, which is the opposite of the hot and then drag in some of the peach colour into that because it bounces off, colour bounces off. I'm doing it rather quickly, but broadly speaking, it, it, it's this kind of thing. The warmth of the peach, uh, all shadow is darkest at its source and it bleeds out into the weakness as it comes across. So he would make the shape of the peach there deepening under there, warmer where it touches the peach, touches the tablecloth, and bleeding out here, because he would do this much slower, more carefully. That is the basic of it. I'll paint a little area around this bottle, and the bottle itself, just to give an idea of the uh, colour harmonies. Cezanne was a diabetic. This made him probably more taciturn than normally. He was rather bad-tempered, to put it simply. A rather morbid man, a morbid disposition. He was, of course, uh, mad in, madly in love with his art, as many artists are, but in his case, he let his wife a bit of a, you know, difficult time because when she posed for him, he said, good God, woman, why can't you sit still like an apple? I think this is after the 78th sitting or something. But I have a feeling, of course, it was his illness that created this part of his nature. He uh, seemed to have uh, exercised hardly any ripple in the artistic world for many, many years. And Eventually, his work became famous when he exhibited finally at the Salon with the Impressionists and without them, and uh, got a, the odd write-up and people started buying his work, so that finally he achieved the fame he'd wanted all his life, unlike, of course, Paul Vincent and many, many other painters. Now, I put while well, I've been yapping, I've put these kind of very crude colours here to show that in, he would wash, I've washed this purpose. I'm not using oils, I'll be honest, because of the drying time. But the same thing applies, I'm applying what he did towards the end of his life when he was very famous in his famous still lives. He painted in washes, they would have been, of course, resin ethereal, the varnish washes, turpentine. Last a long time. Of course, he was a watercolor all life. And um, as we know, paint edges around, leaving the white of the poor canvas go through. This he called bridges, his bridges between one color and another. And you can see here, probably, how the two colours are divided by a piece of white. And of course, this is the uh, a red apple here. So the same thing would apply there, that he would have a bridge of white there. Now, from a distance, this registers and throughout a painting, if you can keep this through a painting, a watercolour or oil of this kind of painting, you achieve a certain luminosity and a certain oneness with the whole thing. It gives a, a different aspect altogether than if you painted up close. Of course, you break it. It's, 
it's the old master technique, actually, of doing a bit and leaving a bit. And um, you don't have to carry it right through, but you see, even Cotsman, the uh, East Anglian watercolour painter, he left bits, Turner did. Uh, but um, Cezanne was one of the few who carried this through and through until um, he died. He, he was uh, very fond of this uh, particular quirk. Now, it seems a lot of fuss over nothing, but um, if you look at his work in the Tate or the Courtauld or wherever you happen to be, you will see that it does, in fact, register enormously from a distance. Of course, he was absolutely determined to make everything as perfect as he could. Not that everything is perfectly round or cylindrical, but it's just the bases for the, the formula he used. Now, here we have... I'm doing this very, very quickly, of course, but here we have roughly the shape of the glass. Divided with wine, glass, bottle behind, see-through, and the stem. And the whole thing is, of course, realised by the fact that this is transparent, this is opaque, so we paint as opaque. Watch the shape of uh, the stem, and that, draw it relatively... I can't, haven't time to do it exactly right, but... You draw the shape of it in washes. Then you have to work out the reflected lights. And in the uh, actual wine, you will have the belly, I'll emphasize it, the belly of the wine comes down like that. And that will echo down there into the tops. And while I'm on the subject of shapes, Cezanne was influenced, of course, much by Pier della Francesca, whose picture, the legend of the true cross, has, of course, many, it's a uh, series of frescoes, of course, and in it, the, the figures are wearing wonderfully shaped hats. And in this Pier della Francesca, who based his own work on the cone, the five regular solids, the pyramid, cone, sphere, and cube, and cylinder, has used the shapes as abstract pattern, the same as Cezanne would use in, for instance, painting the cloth emanating from here. I observe there's a line coming across here. There's a shadow here from the glass. It merges with the shadow from the bottle. Now, he would do this with the utmost care. I mean, obviously, I'm doing it arbitrarily, just to demonstrate. There's a line comes down here. So we have now one rectangle bisected, making a triangular shape. This is very simply made. And there's another one comes here, echoed in this, in the reverse sense, so we have a rectangle bisected, more or less, well, rather third to make this shape. And he would paint this in. I'd better use a large brush to save time. He would paint this in, in the, let's call it the, the whitish, bluish grey. That's to be about a week's work for Cezanne, I should think. Well, anyway, very important, of course, in a painting is the foreground of a landscape or the forepart, of course, of a still life of this nature. I'm painting this as quickly as possible. Let's say that is the tablecloth bit, and there's a bit along here. I've done this more or less purposely in shape form. There's a little shape again down here. We'll pretend this is a triangle. 
We'll echo that with another triangle across here. Then with a little tone, a little slightly different tone, we do the piece in between. Now, the reason I'm saying this and doing this is because those triangular, as crude as they are, shapes will echo, and you don't hardly need to look through the picture, there'll be an echo of this shape here, this shape here, reversed, and so on. In order to break the monotony of this, in the still life, the tablecloth comes right down. Of course, there are many ways of doing this, but in Cezanne, as we're pretending to do a Cezanne, he has and has a predilection for painting the props he had in his studio, like everyone else, props. And one of them, of course, uh, quite well known as it seems to be something like a chest of drawers. It's probably a painting table with a, a drawer. And he would paint a colour that he's very fond of, roughly speaking, a tan cover colour. Now, what we have, of course, is more or less this type of colour. What we have, of course, is the opportunity there in this shape here, which is echoed, so not only is it a complementary shape, it's broken, and this shape echoes this shape in reverse. Just as we've attended to the foreground, the background must receive attention. It's of vital importance that the colours in the painting of this kind, which is really what one would almost call a decorative painting, it's a very derogatory term in a way, but it is a decorative painting. So we bring the colours from the background into the foreground and vice versa. Now I have already painted this once, a, a very quick painting, but I designed a design so that this happened, roughly speaking. This is the old trick uh, of binding a picture together to give a counterbalance to all that's going on here. We make a few little leaves or something up here just to create a little counterbalance of uh, movement onto the blue pattern. Uh, this painting is the second painting and is developed a, a very sm small amount relative to the way Cezanne would have done it. Um, this would probably take him quite a while, but I banged this in in a very crude way just to demonstrate that what appears to be irregular, this is to say the perpendicular of this is off balance, the perpendicular of this counteracts it and so forth, is because this is just to emphasize that in modern painting, we're used to seeing abstractions by Cezanne himself at the beginning of it, by Picasso, etc. And uh, we're so used to abstractions that we, we hardly realize that this man, who was an academic painter, impressionist at one time, was struggling to achieve something different. It's very difficult to create a new form of seeing. So the bottle is off the glass is off, and he counteracts things through. I've uh, stated before that in the design, he, he's got to kind of make a design out of the still life. So he would emphasize very quietly little movements in the profile of the fruit here, for instance. Then he would bring up let's say, a leaf form to echo a lemon shape in an e elongated type of thing. This is a very crude way of saying how his mind worked. Of course, I don't know that. No one does. But this is the kind of way he was struggling towards a new form of painting. So having designed the painting, he would then come back to the business of painting the painting in a very almost naive way of pure colour. You go now, say, to the lemon and make lemon shapes. The lemon, this one in particular, there's no other lemon in the world exactly like this one. It has its own nature, its own volume, its own shape, 
its own being. In fact, it has its own personality. This is the way he would look at it. So he would look and look and look. I haven't the time here, but... And he would observe the nipple shape here, the plane there of pure lemon colour. Then he'd kill that lemon colour with a little warmth because it's coming near you. Remember in perspective again. Then he would remember that under that would come a little darker, this next segment. Then under there, of course, would surprisingly become very light because of the echo of the tablecloth. And if you look at Cezanne's, you, or any academic painter of that matter, you will observe the underbelly painting and the top painting. Not only is the underbelly necessary, but the top light, the lemon light, if there's natural light above or from the side, this will also be lightened. Hence the edge painting of before. Then the nipple bit will have a highlight and this will be blended in to create form. Broadly speaking, that is a, a lemon as he would have taken probably a day to paint that. And gradually, thinking on these terms, he achieves an approximation of the truth of what he's painting. The redness of the apple will sing out like a, a beautiful note sung by a bird. It's like uh, in Constable, he always introduced a little red of poppies or a boy's hat or something. It's an old Dutch trick, actually. Now, with the application of paint, which I'm putting on relatively slowly, uh, with one stroke in the whole of the picture, Cezanne would decide and put one pure note here in this apple, for example, a dominant red, and would kill, gradually kill, by killing we mean diminution of tone, of strength, the reds around it, making this the one dominant bit. Towards the end of the painting, of course, we go into the lights and darks on the apricots, they have, of course, bloom. Now, bloom is a remarkably difficult colour to put on because it's a, a, a pure scumble. So you do that when the, the paint's dry, and you always peaches, grapes. Normally, in academic painting, of course, they're painted in the broadest sense. In the, the old Victorian and 18th century chaps, they, they paint them with an incredible thin whisper, a kiss of air, which represents the softness of the peach and can only be achieved by this soft, gentle caress of cool over the warmth of the skin. But having done a bit there, I must, of course, carry this through. We must remember this is a decorative type of painting, and what we're doing in the foreground, we need to take to the background and so forth to give the unity required to give aesthetic appeal. We will help this dying creature here a little bit. That was a bit to and a touch here and there in the fruit, just a teeny weeny touch to give it to take the harshness of way of things and so on. And of course it won't all wants refined. Now this is in a good state for a coat of varnish and a really serious paint. And that's about all I can do to this. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>